time for our feature presentation. Tonight's speaker is Mr. Mark McCahill. He is, uh, Mark works for the Office of Information Technology at Duke University, and his topic is going to be Linux Containers for Learning. How do we support... <coughs> You didn't introduce the best part. Mark wrote GoPro. Oh, right. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how, many, how many people know about Gopher? <laughs> All right. Well, for those who don't, um, Gopher was the thing we had before the web. You would log in, and it had menus, and it had um, you could download files and documents and browse around. And it was really cool. It's basically the thing that the web drew a lot of inspiration from. And I actually found about, out about Gopher when I was about seven years old. My dad had this book, my dad had this book called The Internet for Dummies um, that was published, I think, the year I was born. Oh, <laughs> And Gopher was in it, and I read about it. And then a few years later, when he actually let me on the internet, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to use Gopher now. And then it's like, where'd Gopher go? <laughs> but yeah, but in addition to, but besides Go, but Mark does a lot of other exciting things besides Gopher, and so I'm just going to turn it over to him for him to talk about that. Okay, uh, you like my mic level? Because um, this is the volume I'm going to talk at, so. <laughs> <laughs> that should be fine. All right, try again. How's that? Yeah, is that good enough? Yeah, yeah. You guys good? Okay. Yeah. Um, usually with these file intro things, my deal is to say, uh, there's a Wikipedia page, just look me up there, most of it's right, unless someone's to face the page. Uh, you don't need to take notes, this presentation is available, and the last slide will have the link to the place at Fox where you can download the whole thing, so people who like to take notes don't need to bother, unless they really enjoy that. Um, okay, so background. I came to Duke about eight years ago to be a system architect, and one of the areas that I was, am, was and am interested in working on is support for teaching and learning and research and a bunch of other things, but uh, when Lenora asked, hey, was there something you want to talk about, I thought, well, the learning environment stuff's kind of interesting, and what we're doing using some of the new technology is, I think, moderately cool. But before I get to the cool stuff, I need to motivate this with what the problem is and then the history that we came from so you see why we're doing the stuff the way we're doing it. So what is your problem, McKay Hill? You look like you've got some issue. Um, if you think about it, code is a first-class citizen in media now, right? I mean, live, active code, things that run are as important as words or pictures or movies or that stuff, or at least they ought to be for a lot of disciplines. And so the code, the analysis tools, the data sets ought to be kind of an important part of a lot of courses and classes that get taught at universities. Um, the problem is that each class is covering different ground, right? They have different subjects, so maybe the tools that you need are going to be kind of different. And then there are no two faculty members that are going to agree on what the optimal set of tools are. That faculty members just don't agree on that kind of stuff. So because of that, you've got this trying to support all sorts of customized worlds for different courses with different instructors who have different takes on how to teach that stuff. The, another problem is if you've ever taught a course with like more than two people in it, you want to concentrate on the class, not on debugging software installs on student laptops. I mean, the last thing you care about in the world is that this person has a little bit different version of Windows or whatever, and they didn't quite install this right, now we're going to spend 10 minutes trying to figure out why their stuff doesn't even work. That's no fun, and that's not what you're there for. That's getting you away from what you're there for. So they want customized environments, and they want them to work reliably so that they can concentrate on what they're really trying to do, which is teach their course, not debug someone's software install or some wacky operating system. So what's the problem? Well, we're trying to support code as a first-class citizen in the media and do that for lots of different uses. But putting it on the laptops may be not the best approach always. How do we make this stuff flexible and scale? And if you've got a class that's got a lot of students in it, just think of the problems. I mean, 
a class with a dozen students is one thing. There you could run around and you know kind of help them, but if you've got hundreds, you're not going to help them one by one. So, ancient history. In the beginning, in the old days, and I'm old enough that I remember doing punch cards that you'd submit to run Fortran jobs and that stuff. Eventually, we thought things were getting pretty good when we had like microcomputer labs that you could go into and sit down at a machine and you'd have your own machine. That was pretty cool in the day. But physical labs, even recent physical labs, have got issues. Because the user is sitting at the machine, they've got physical control of it. So there's a great story about one of the labs at a major research institution in the Triangle area <laughs> where people came and uh, run or sit down and do Linux jobs and that stuff. But some of the students also wanted to do that remotely, so they'd go and do remote sessions into those machines. And it worked out that students would kind of gravitate towards one machine, and it's a really large class, so you'd end up with a whole bunch of students, remote log-ins on a physical machine that a person is sitting at. That person <laughs> might notice that the machine had gotten slow. <laughs> and they've got a, their hand on the power cord, <laughs> and they can pull the power cord out. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they do it because the machine seems slow and maybe, you know, that, I'll just restart it. And then the machine would be fast for quite a while until <laughs> everyone logged back in. <laughs> of course, this was less than optimal for the remote users. Uh, another thing that would happen in a physical lab, especially with laptops, is people would say, hey, I actually, I need to plug my laptop in. The battery's getting low. So it's another way that power cords get yanked. So physical labs have some advantages if there's no remote access, but once you start doing remote access, which you kind of want to do, and with everything connected, you start doing it, you end up with the power cable being kind of a problem, and who's got control of that, right? Another problem with those ancient history kind of labs is, kind of by their nature, there's one OS or one image per machine. I mean, it's booted to run a thing, and that's it. Can you imagine the fights between the faculty about which version of which tool and which supporting libraries need to be on here to run their stuff and somebody else wants to run a different version. I felt really bad for the guys who support the labs because they have to mediate these fights and it's pretty much impossible, right? You've got two important faculty members who have important classes but they need things that don't mesh well together. And if you've got one physical machine, well, it's, it's how are you going to do this? Now, you can get clever about how you do installs and all that, but it's a lot of work. So that stuff's not too cool. So about the time I got here, there was the beginning of a search for a better way. There must be some better way we could do these compute environments that have more flexibility and you know get away from some of the physical problems. What's the answer to this? I know, let's virtualize, right? Think of eight, seven, eight years ago, the answer was starting to be, let's virtualize stuff, and that's still a pretty good answer. So in the beginning, I made a trek when I first arrived here within the first couple months over to this campus to see a pretty cool demo of a thing called Virtual Computer Lab, or VCL. This was developed at NCSU. A lot of the funding came from IBM. Um, it's basically a course-oriented reservation system where students can reserve uh, a slot on a machine or a set of machines with a specific <laughs> image on it. Basically, it's a reservation system that uses XCAP to manage IBM Blade Center resources. Pretty cool. We looked at that and went, hey, this would solve some of our problems because we could have multiple different images. The student wouldn't have their hand on the power cord to yank the cord out. Uh, you can kind of multiplex multiple people on there. When they get done with the reservation, they can walk away. Someone else could come in. VCL is a cool thing. Uh, we liked it a lot. but. When I got back to Duke, after getting all excited, I talked to the local sysadmins and they said, we don't do that XCAT stuff and we don't have any blade centers. <laughs> so that's sort of a problem. So what we ended up doing was porting VCL to Duke's environment. Uh, we put in some support for doing authentication the way we do it with Shibboleth, Shib slash SAML got put in because we needed that for authentication. More importantly, we modified VCL so it would use VMware as a back end. So instead of talking to XCAP to, mo to tell Blades, load this image, start up, start down, here's the user that can connect to you, we did the same stuff with the VMware back end. 
mostly because we had infrastructure around, we already had VMware and there were some spare cycles available there. Also did a little bit of integration into the identity management system to know who's in which class. But the important part was start hooking it up to a VMware backend because then we could virtualize stuff. Even better, we could set the size of the machines to accommodate the appropriate size of the image that you needed to run. So if you had something that was big and needed a lot of resources, give it a big VM. If you had something teeny that wasn't very important and didn't need much teeny VM. Good stuff. This took a while to get rolling, but each year more people would use it. Most of the usage profiles where students come in, they use it for two hours to finish an assignment, and they bail out because the assignment's done. And then they're back, typically right before the assignment is due, all trying to get their stuff done. But we kind of hit our heads on some drawbacks, at least perceived by the user community, about well, it's not quite what I wanted for some things. Because VCL was kind of oriented towards the idea of it's for doing your assignment, get in, get the assignment done, and go away, because that's kind of student mindset, is I need to get my assignment done and I'm out of there. Some people chafed at the, uh, the idea that their sessions didn't persist forever, forever. Uh, and you could see that. You could particularly see that for people who wanted to do long projects. If you had a class project where you're building some software over the last half of the semester, or something that's oriented towards, you can have little two-hour time slices and we'll recreate your, your environment when you come back, but stuff doesn't keep running, that wasn't cutting it for them. Another thing that wasn't cutting it for them is if they wanted to build a server that ran, well, <laughs> two-hour reservations don't make it. So. One thing that wasn't there was really long running sessions. Another thing that wasn't there was the idea that you'd modified that environment and then because it persists for a really long time, you could like build it over time and it'd keep going. Um, we tended to, and still with VCL, wipe the machine completely and put a virgin image in place. Now this is actually a selling point with your security guys who get nervous about students doing anything on machines. <laughs> because you give a su student stu sudo access on a powerful machine on your campus network and well, anything could happen. So the idea that we would blow away the system and put a new clean one in place at the start of each session made the security guys feel good, but the <coughs> users weren't so crazy about it. Another thing that was a complaint that I thought was kind of funny because I'm so used to the old stuff was that people would complain about the startup times taking a really long time. Like, maybe a minute or two. It's just outrageous. <laughs> Why were the startup times taking a minute or two? Why was that outrageous? Well, they take a minute or two because you're starting from a template image of the VM, you splat, or image of the thing you want to run, you splat that onto a VM, and then you need to personalize it just a little bit for the user to get like his home directory there so he can get back to his files. If it's a Windows, machine and you're trying to mount home directories, you might also have to reboot the thing and have to wait for that whole stuff to get done. So users are complaining about stuff, but we're kind of going, well, you know, deal with it. Then a great thing happened. Um, there was an initiative sponsored by the provost and the CIO and the president at Duke to help seed innovation. I looked at this and said, oh, thank you. I now have an excuse for doing stuff I wanted to do anyway in support of <laughs> doing innovation. So maybe one of the lessons out of this, a social engineering lesson, is given the opportunity, if you can align what you wanted to do anyway with what the big bosses want, it's a great way to get them to say yes. Innovation CoLab is the idea that students should be able to do projects unrelated to classes and you know, do cool, innovative stuff, see what they could come up with. We looked at that and said, okay, well, I guess they're going to need to have servers because if they want to do, like, mobile applications, well, they need a server to go with their phone app, and the server would need to be up all the time, probably at least for the whole semester so they can develop it and so they can, you know, run it any time. So VCL can't cut it for this. We'll have to do something else. Uh, another thing that our security guys like is put everything on a private address so it's only accessible on the Duke campus network. 
that's not going to cut it for phone apps because half the time you're coming in over the carrier's network, so you've got to have a public IP address. Thus, we worked ourselves around to saying, okay, we need servers that persist, that students have root access on, public IP addresses, but powerful and in the data center. Does anyone think the security people had an issue? <laughs> <laughs> what sort of issue did they have? Well, quite a few of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how do you mitigate this problem? Um, the answer is you say, well, this is actually about the same as a student running a server that they have in their dorm room. I mean, it's pretty much the same thing. They've got complete control of the server in their dorm room, and so, you know, we're letting them do that. We could let them do this stuff here. We have, in some ways, a little bit more control here. We ended up putting the servers for the Innovation CoLab in the same portion of the network that the residence halls are in. Now, physically, they are located in the data center, but logically, they're part of the res hall network. If the firewalling and that stuff is good enough for residence halls, then it must be good enough for this stuff, right? This is how you get your security guys to stop hyperventilating and feel good about life. And this is how you feel good about life, too, because while it's a fairly powerful machine, it couldn't do anything too bad to the rest of the data center. So maybe another lesson out of this is don't just align with what the big bosses want. Look at how stuff is already being done and align with what the security guys have already said yes to. And because everything was virtualized, it wasn't a big deal to put these on the right part of the network. So um, we ended up doing a reservation system that wasn't VCL, but we called it VM Manage, initially with just the idea of doing it for a few VMs for these innovation collab things. And I think, yeah, uh, VCL, we've talked about that. VM Manage, semester-long reservation, students have root access. We give them a small lecture about with freedom comes responsibility. Uh, our, another interesting thing of doing this, because it's running in the data center, the first, I had some discussions with our system administrators who were saying, but, but, but I mean, who's going to patch these? And how are they going to get backed up? And all that. And I said, this is not your problem. You are not responsible at all. Totally not responsible. Not your issue. We don't do backups. Students will figure out their own way to do a backup if they want to. I hope they do, but if they don't, too bad. No tears. <laughs> Patches. Totally their responsibility. I hope they patch stuff. If they don't and there's an exploit, the security office will block their IP address. Well, it's the same thing we do in res halls, right? Or with the wireless stuff. Uh, and installation of apps and libraries, totally their responsibility. System administrators, you are not responsible for these machines. I had to say that for about a week to get them to believe that really they weren't responsible. But after we got to that point of saying, let the users have control, it's, it's effectively the same thing as in their dorm room. You're not managing those. We decided it was OK to do this. Again, sequestering them into a part of the network where they weren't official or topologically in the, the data center with the important servers helped a lot. Now, that all sounds good, but you also got to give them, since it's remote, enough of a control panel to be able to do the same sort of things that our sysadmins would do using, if we're doing VMware or <coughs> vCenter. You got to be able to let them power the machine on and off because occasionally you'll need that for doing installs. You got to give them a way to reload the original image if they really screwed things up. And that does happen. Got to give them a way to make snaps. Snapshot of the image before you do a big hairy install so you can go back to the snapshot instead of having to go back to the very beginning. So snaps and restore the snaps. We also wanted them to have an exit strategy when they graduate. And so we also gave them a way to export the image so that they could run that on their laptop in VirtualBox or move it to the cloud or some VMware cluster or something like that. So if you are going to go down this path, your shopping list of the basic functions that you'd need to let someone else have a good time is this. 
which is almost the same sort of thing that you start seeing if you go to some of the now popular cloud services, right? They let you turn machines on and off. Ideally, they let you do snaps. There should be a way to export a VMDK. All that stuff should be there. Uh, we just kind of simplified it and put it in a nice web interface for the students. Next problem. Okay, so I told the system administrators that none of these images were their problem because it was the only way to let them let go and let the students have root. But I can't just give them generic Linux images. That's not going to cut it for a lot of the students because they don't want to be system administrators all that much. They want to build applications. So we said we'll need to have some pre-built application stacks so that they can do stuff like Ruby on Rails or Django or Node or LAMP or that kind of stuff. I had stumbled into a great resource for getting app stacks. Uh, if you are not familiar with these guys, Bitnami, now bitnami.com, but Bitnami packages up open source stuff so that you don't have to come up with, if you're doing Ruby on Rails, you'd have to have, let's see, Ruby and maybe Passenger. You probably want MySQL database uh, and two or three other components, maybe. What Bitnami does is package up the four or five components you'd need for a complete app stack so they all work together in a nice installer. Saves a ton of time because you don't have to go and try to find which version of this goes with which version of that. Their stuff mostly just works. So we got away from having to get the system administrators into building these things by just leaning on what Bitnami had already done. Bitnami's doing this partly so that people can easily spin up stuff in cloud services because most people doing stuff in the cloud have the same issue. I don't want to go through the excitement, the thrill, the fun of <laughs> figuring out how to get the appropriate images or appropriate app versions to work together. That's not really what most people want to do all that much of. You typically want to build your app. So if it sounds like we backed ourselves into, like three years ago, running what was a little baby cloud service optimized for student use, that's precisely what happened. Um, the other thing we did was sneaky really sneaky. I was tired of listening to people complain about how long it takes to stand up the image. I don't want to wait for two minutes. I'm a busy person. I don't have two minutes to spare. <laughs> so what is the answer? How can you avoid that problem? Question for the audience. How would you avoid the problem? Well, I don't want to wait for things to get provisioned. Have some links. Ready to go. Already ready. Bingo. <laughs> you cheat. You spin them up already. <laughs> And so it looks to the user like it's instantaneous because all you're doing is saying, this guy gets this pre-running thing, go. But people love that stuff. Uh, and it doesn't cost you much. It also gives you the good feeling that you know you can run all of the images that are available because they're already running. You're not going to end up with a bunch of people showing up and then, oh crap, my infrastructure just crumpled because I can't spin these up. They're already running. You know they can spin up and run. Uh, demo. So I have done a few demos in my life. And I've also learned of late that if I just record them in a video, then I can do magic. I can like, control things with my mind or pretend I am. But for sure, the network is not an issue. So we're going to have several CAM demos here that are videos. Uh, if you download the QuickTime video of the copy of the presentation, it's got those videos in there, so it's kind of big. But on the other hand, you can play the demo yourself. So let's watch one of these. Oh, except this is the one that I just did screenshots for, I think. So what's it look like? Uh, the user logs in. We know who they are. Uh, they ask, or we ask them, tell us what this thing is and who are the contacts. This is old. This is from like my original uh, VM manage. Uh, show and tell. So at this point we've got about 18, I think, something like that, different images. A terms of use that they have to agree to. Uh, it says, do you really want this? You click request VM and like that, it's available. And we give them uh, where to go, what their password is. Uh, everybody gets the same name on the 
the image. Then I don't have to personalize it at all. All of them log in as the user Bitnami. I mean, there's no point in personalizing it to make it the user be named McCahill. If they want that, they can do that, but that wouldn't let me do instantaneous spin-ups. So again, it's just like the cloud service stuff. Standardization is your friend. You also get an email that tells you the things available. Uh, and when you go to the thing, since we again are leaning heavily on Bitnami, and you can probably tell how old this is if you've been looking at Bitnami. <laughs> it's an old image. Um, there's a website thing that's already running. You're off to the races. That was pretty successful. In fact, that's successful now to the point that we're typically seeing about 250 or so of these per semester in active use. What is fascinating is fashion. When we first started doing this, the fashionable application stacks were LAMP and Ruby on Rails. The next semester, LAMP was still pretty popular. Node.js became super popular. Everyone wanted to do Node. By the next year, hardly anyone was doing Node. <laughs> and there was a bunch of Django stuff starting, and then Django fell out of favor for some reason. And lately, what's the most popular seems to be Ubuntu 14.04 LTS. <laughs> so I guess I've come, come full cycle, and now people don't want those app stacks all that much. Well, they do, but the growth we've seen is people who want just kind of bare machines with a Linux on there. Uh, we did work our way from originally doing just app stacks to realizing that a lot of people were wanting we're just throwing the app stack away and just saying using it to get a Linux and then installing their own stuff. So then we've wised up and said, okay, well, we'll make available uh, Red Hat Enterprise 6 and 7 and Ubuntu 1204 and 1404. Interestingly enough, the Ubuntu ones are proving to be the most popular for some reason. Another thing that's been really interesting is the sysadmins teach an intro to Linux class a bunch of times during the semester. <coughs> They started using this as a way to give each student taking the class uh, a VM to play with for the rest of the semester. So what we're seeing happen now is people start out with take the class. Some of them, at the end of the semester, uh, we send out a, hey, if you don't want it, we're going to recycle it. If you tell us you want to keep it, you can keep it. We see them start out and keep them, and some of them have kept them for like three, four semesters. So some people turn into long-term residents here. The other thing I see happening is things that started out as student projects then graduate into wanting to be full-fledged real servers run in production land, and so we tell them how to move their stuff over to the real infrastructure. Um, so that brings us up to last spring. Well, spring a year ago in May. Um, I was coming out of the meeting and Someone said, hey, Mark, maybe we'd like to run some statistics course stuff on VM Manage. You're into the making those VMs and that stuff. That's cool, right? I said, oh, yeah, no problem. I said, okay, well, I'll have the faculty member contact you in a little bit, and uh, you, you can work it out with them. And so I got a hold of the faculty member and found out that they wanted to use something called RStudio. You guys, some people have heard of RStudio. RStudio is very cool if you're into statistics. Um, R is a great statistics package. RStudio is an IDE for that that runs entirely in a web browser. Very, very cool stuff. I totally see why they're using that to teach intro stats. If you have any interest in statistics, I would suggest take a look at RStudio, one of my pro tips. So anyway, the instructor said, yeah, we're going to use RStudio. We'd like to do that. Here's why. I said, OK, well, I'll start working on it. now." That spring, I'd also gotten quite enamored with containers as an idea. i have been playing around with them some, but I hadn't found any real use for them that, you know, in big time production. But a little bit later, not in May, but more like July-ish, and classes start in August, the faculty member mentioned, by the way, there's going to be around 300 students, <laughs> and they want the environments to persist. Uh oh. I don't think we have a spare 300 VMs <laughs> just sitting there. <laughs> and it might be a little bit tight trying to order those, but I think if I put this stuff inside of Docker containers, 
I can shoehorn a lot more environments onto much smaller hardware. That turned out to be true. So I got lucky this time. Um, although I had a pretty good feeling that, that would work out. So everything I've described up to now is motivation for the container stuff. Now we get to the cool part of the talk, OK? If you were not paying attention before now, wake up, pay attention. This is the good stuff. Problems. So they want this. They've got a lot of students. The reason they wanted to do this at Duke is that they've been using an RStudio service run by the company that makes RStudio, but the only way the students could log in was using Google Gmail credentials for authentication, and it was a nightmare for the faculty member to try to get credentials from 300 students for, what's your Gmail account again? Oh, you told me wrong? I mean, think about that. Gathering up 300 accounts, that's just... They didn't like that. So the step one, they loved the idea that with the students could use their NetID, the standard Duke authentication, and the instructor wouldn't have to mess with the authentication at all. Another thing they liked, and this gets back to one of my original points, the instructor wanted to have a different set of libraries that was optimized to what the instructor wanted to do. And when they were running stuff in a shared environment at our studio, the company's thing, with a bunch of other courses, that wasn't happening. They had to negotiate or ask, could you please maybe put this in, and I hope that doesn't conflict. Since we're building a container just for this course, it was no problem. It's just tell me what you want, we will put it in there, it's all good. <coughs> Thus, Duke instance of our studio. Now, I could, and you can, run our studio as a monolithic server with a bunch of users logged in. I mean, that's the classic old school way of doing that. I was nervous about that, though, because I didn't know how well it would scale. And if it's a monolith, I don't have a good way of spreading it out over more hardware. I can only make the server bigger, and there's limits to how big the servers can be made. I wasn't comfortable with being able to predict load sizes. And another thing that we've learned the hard way is that multi-user systems, where users can install arbitrary code, what could happen there? In fact, what always happens there? Something gets hacked, then everybody, you have to presume that everybody's credentials might have been compromised or you have to clean the server up. Anything you can do to put users in little jails that are just affecting them is a good thing because then when one of them screws up, it didn't screw up everyone, it just screwed up that one person. Much easier to clean up and recover from. What we call an unfortunate series of events with broad impact. So we could have done personal VMs. I mean, we had that, but the re it's kind of resource intensive. And really, the only thing that's varying in this class is the state of the computation and the data in the user's home directory. I mean, otherwise, it's all the same stuff. So they don't really need personal VMs. Thus, Docker made sense. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Docker? How many people don't know what I'm talking about when I say Docker and container? Some people would be. OK, so a way to think of Docker and, a con and containers in general, they're basically a lightweight form of virtualization. You're still running things in the same OS with the other containers, but you've at least got the file system ch rooted, or you've got a little jail so that people can't see other people's file systems. There's a bunch of hacks that are done to do cute things like say, OK, well, if the user changes anything, then it's copy on write, and we'll write those changes over there so we don't duplicate the whole file system. And we don't duplicate the whole OS environment. We just dupli or change, duplicate the things that the user changed. So think of it as lightweight form of virtualization. Because it's lightweight that way, you don't have the whole network stack and the whole OS stack for each user. Instead, you're really just having little chunks of stuff that are the deltas. So it's lightweight. Because users were in their own little jails, we could transparently migrate them around. And this would also let us sequester the students as much as possible. Now, it's not as good as a full-fledged VM, but it's a lot more resource <coughs> Well, used a lot less in the way of resources, so that's a good thing. So architecture. Uh, now we get to the good stuff. 
So what the user does, uh, they show up, they get authenticated so we know who they are, they get to this website, the website has a database that maps users to which container they're on. And once it looks up who the user is, or assigns them to a container if they've never been here before and they need to get one, writes that to the database, redirect the user over to the appropriate place. So I might have, say, three servers running a bunch of containers on each one, and this user ends up getting redirected to this port on this server with a home directory connected to that container. The reason for connecting an external home directory is I want to sequester the stuff that the user wrote, his personal data from the container, so I can rebuild and restart the container without blowing away his stuff. When you do these container things, you are forced to get serious about thinking about exactly which ports do I need to expose to the universe, and exactly which parts of the file system need to be persisted for each user. So we did this. Then in the background so that we were making <coughs> backups because this is a course, so I, you know, I'm responsible for backups now. It's not the Wild West of some of those Colab VMs. In the background, we're running rsync to send the home directories to a backup mule that then goes into our regular TSM backup infrastructure. I like this because the backups were happening outside of the user's control so they couldn't possibly screw them up. <laughs> Hey, it's in a different space. They can't mess that up. It's a good thing. So we ended up uh, with a little RStudio Docker farm that was three servers with a whopping eight gig of RAM and two CPUs per server and a 300 gig hard disk. Um, and we were packing 110 RStudio containers per server. It worked out that those things only had a memory footprint or have a memory footprint of about 52 meg per container slash per user. Now this is because it's an intro stats class. If you're doing really heavy duty stuff, your footprint could be way, way, way bigger. But for intro stats, you can shoehorn a whole bunch of them in here. Um, every five minutes, we're doing a little sync of the, the backups to that backup mule, so at worst they lose five minutes worth of work. Pretty sweet. Uh, what does it look like to the user? Okay, now I've got a video, so here. I'm using mind control. I click on the Docker thing. I click there, click to log in, and that fast I am sent over to the <laughs> container running the web stuff with the RStudio things in it. Uh, and now I say good things about RStudio, like look at how cool this is. You've got multiple panes. You can copy and paste stuff. I can open up a file, I can say, turn this thing into some HTML or PDF and it'll generate output of things, which is how the students turn their assignments in. I mean, it is a cool package. Uh, I can do crazy stuff. <laughs> crazy stuff, like from that web page, I just let's go back a little bit. This thing goes a little fast in this part. Look at that. Under tools, there's an option for shell. <laughs> it's what you think it is. <laughs> <laughs> From that web browser, in that container, I can shell out. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> PS, AUX. OK, but there aren't that many processes running. Why? because they're in a little jail. They're in a little container, so they only see the processes running inside their container. There's a whole bunch of other processes running on this machine, but they don't get to them because they're containerized. Uh, but you can, from there, do stuff like, who am I? I mapped everybody to guest. Uh, look at the file system. You can see that uh, I've mounted an external file system, which are some of those funky things. You can do SCPs and SSHs in and out of there. You can ping things. So while it doesn't look like Linux on the surface, it is underneath, and you can get there from the web browser. Slick stuff. Uh, yeah, I think I'd do an SSH session. No, I, I decided not to. Um, OK, so there. Our studio guys should thank me for this. So that was kind of neat. And then there was just like one more thing that came up. 
Um, when we were doing this, Google was casting around for getting people interested in Google Compute, their cloud service. And so somebody came to me, Mark DeLong, one of the guys who does research computing stuff for Duke, and said, hey, okay, do you have anything that might be a fit for Google Compute? And I said, well, maybe. Um, this RStudio thing I mean, makes it so that we kind of don't care where we're running this stuff, so maybe that would be good to put up in Google Compute, too. So Google gave us a grant of compute cycles, in other words, funny money. We didn't get charged for 10K worth of uh, compute cycles. Because those containers don't care what the underlying OS is that they're running on, they carry what you built as the OS inside the container. I could take, without modifications, the Linux with RStudio built in it and plop it onto Google Compute without any real tiers. So that means I could do basically compute arbitrage, right? I could move my compute workloads around to wherever it's cheapest, and free is cheap, <laughs> until it's not free anymore, and then I could move that stuff off of there until we can get another grant for free someplace else. Uh, or maybe I use this as a way of doing peak load stuff, cloud burst, put it on the cloud when I use up the local stuff. So architecture phase two, when we started going, oh, well, we could do some co cool stuff with Google, Compute, or Amazon, or Azure, any of these would work here, right? I mean, it, you're agnostic about where you run the container. Because there's this front end that's mapping users to where the container lives, and it points to a machine and a port, the users don't even need to know that I move them. I pick the container up, move it to a different location. All I have to do is update the entry in the database on the VM managed front end that they start from to get to their container, and we're off to the races. The same backup strategy still works. It's all good. Yes? While they're running or between sessions? That's worth a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> um, between sessions. While it, one thing that and this is like from last fall. So the Docker stuff's changing, and there's, I know they're working on making things that you might even be able to move between while the sessions are running. Here, you'd have to stop, pick it up, move it, and restart it. But that worked okay for most of the classes because students don't do work on Saturday mornings. <laughs> <laughs> Something happened Friday night, and they're indisposed. Um, I have so, personal curiosity. Um, do you have any restore requests for, you know, for your Arjun phone to run? Do you have anything you know, for up in the end? I haven't. Uh, I have had a couple students manage to screw up R so badly that I had to go in and delete the saved state of R so that the container could start up again. They did something that was so big that it like killed R and then R would try to restart with and restore its state, to, which was dead, and successfully kill itself over and over again. <laughs> had like two of those, but otherwise, no. Okay. Um, so, managing containers. Phase one, three servers. Uh, phase two, more servers, but not on-prem. Uh, phase three is, we looked at, but I'm sad to say I didn't get around to doing, because we got into some other stuff that I'll get to in a minute, uh, was the idea of doing a single core OS cluster. Core OS uh, is optimized for doing container stuff and optimized for doing containers spread across multiple data centers. Phase three would have been, if we'd gotten around to it, a single core OS cluster spanning both on-prem and uh, the Google stuff but other more interesting things came up. So phase three, cool. Um, one thing to think about here is that once you start doing cloud, doing backups this kind of way where you're using something that's always available, rsync, is what you end up having to do. I could have done TSM backups if everything was on-prem, but as soon as I go to Google, that's not going to work for me. So there is some forward-looking stuff here. I, I think I better assume that I will be running in places that are not my data center, thus backups to a backup mule via rsync. Uh, just a little thing to think about. 
So, um, what did I learn from this? What should you learn from this? I haven't, I've glossed over how those containers got built, uh, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But you basically have a script, and you tell it to run, and it gets as far as it can, and then says, oh, problem, bad luck, this didn't work. However, the next time you run it, you don't have to wait for it to go through all the steps up to the one that failed. So incremental builds with Docker scripts are really nice because it saves a ton of time if you're building something with a whole bunch of steps. Uh, that alone seemed like a way to, or a good thing. And the, the intro stats guys wanted a bunch of weird R libraries that had a whole bunch of weird dependencies, and then they wanted tech, which had a whole bunch of weird dependencies, so I was fighting dependency hell, but the incremental builds made it way, way easier. Because the containers are ephemeral, persistent data's gotta live outside the containers. You've gotta get explicit about what's persistent and treat that differently from the stuff that's inside the container that gets rebuilt when the container gets re-instanced. Instance. So Docker does this by letting you map volumes where you say this external volume shows up inside the container as this thing. Because it's an external volume, when the container goes away, it's still there. When you start a new container, you map that in again, and stuff persists. Um, the thing I just mentioned, don't assume that you're always in your data center, sometimes you're not. And maybe the other one that I've hit a couple times is because containers are cool, they let you make things mobile, you pretty much have to have some way of mapping or redirecting users to the current location of where you're running that container if you want to do this cloud bursty move them between server thing, and that's a lot of the reason to want to do them, right? I came into this not knowing what it was going to take to run our studio for all these students, I gave myself a ton of flexibility to spread them out and move them around because I had this redirection, something you always want. So last fall, after we'd gotten this going and it was several weeks into the semester and it was all working, of course it's time to look at what the next thing is. And people are saying, well, you know, that was neat for our studio, well, couldn't you do that for some other things? Like what about MATLAB? or Mathematica, or the Eclipse IDE. I, I mean, we want those. What they meant is, we want those with zero install for the user. The user doesn't want to screw around with installing X client or X servers and configuring all that. So I started looking into something called NoVNC. And NoVNC is, if you, has anyone looked at NoVNC? With Jimmy as my witness, <laughs> it is a cool thing. Um, the pitch here is that VNC or RDP clients can run inside of modern web browsers. The web browsers are fast enough. Your network is fast enough. You can write them in JavaScript. It's fast enough. HTML5 made this kind of stuff feasible. So. Because it's fast enough to run a VNC or RDP client inside of a web browser, why not do that? Especially for course-oriented stuff where you don't want to have the students installing anything other than the web browser. If you could possibly get this to run in a browser, you would open up the possibility of running pretty much any X GUI from Linux inside a browser with zero install on the part of the client. So it took a little bit of doing to figure out how to get it to build, but my pain is your gain. The source <laughs> for that stuff is up on GitHub, and the links are at the end of the presentation. Uh, after figuring out how to get that to work, I started piloting some X window stuff inside of Docker containers so that the terminal is embedded in the web browser, and the ones that I listed that people were asking for are up and out there. Um, I put them out as a pilot thing. No courses were using them because I wasn't sure how well it would work. But it looks like for uh, classes starting in a couple weeks, there's at least one group that's going to be using MATLAB this way, um, small group. So another demo. What's it look like? Again, we start at VM Manage. Uh, this is a newer demo. Note that there are more Docker containers than just our studio now. <laughs> uh, starts up actually about that fast. You get redirected, and since it was already running, there you go. I had built a 
an icon so I could just click and start up MATLAB. So MATLAB starts, and now within the web browser I can type stuff like demo, and it takes me to the documentation for the demo, and I could scroll around and say, ah, 3D, that's cool, everyone likes 3D. Uh, that, but I can't remember how to do one, but there's some examples. So yeah, I could copy and paste <laughs> this thing in and look like I'm a MATLAB guru, and actually I'm the last thing like a MATLAB guru. Um, the torture test is something 3D, can it rotate around? And it does pretty well if you're on a good network. This was on a good <laughs> network at Duke. If you're on a crappy network, you know, your mileage will vary. But it could work. Um, another good test is to run a web browser inside the web browser. <laughs> Think about this for a minute. I'm running a web browser <laughs> to run X windows interpreted inside of a JavaScript thing so that I can launch Firefox <laughs> to see Firefox and run it from my web browser. Uh, I like to reach around, touch my ear that way. Um, the torture test here is to go to YouTube. <laughs> because everyone wants to go to YouTube, of course. Uh, it's a good test to see how well you can do it painting the screen. Uh, there's no sound in this client, but who is Kimmy? I don't know. I survived it. Okay. Uh, let's skip the ad and get to someone getting fired. <laughs> so the point is, uh, even if I go full screen, it's a little jerky, but it's adequate, I think. This is why you could get away with running MATLAB using no VNC, because you can get away with running like YouTube videos in a browser, inside a browser. Now, because I am into full disclosure, here I'll do a little bit of Mathematica, and this one's going to tear a little bit. There, see the tearing? When I scrolled, did you see the little tear, tear, tear? Yeah. It's not perfect, but good enough for students, I think. <laughs> I mean, the alternative is go ahead and install X, kids. <laughs> That'll be fun for you. Uh, and oh yeah, Eclipse IDE, and I can do Eclipse stuff, and it does syntax highlighting and all that. So, we've got an existence proof that you could, inside a container, do all this stuff, uh, package it up, and you'd have the same virtues that you had with the RStudio stuff, that you could move it around and put it in appropriate places. Uh, that's, I think, moderately cool. And I think you don't need to see the rest of that video, because you've already seen RStudio. So, where did that leave us? Well, we started with our studio and putting something that was already pretty much web-oriented into containers and had success with it. In fact, there's 300 students in this class, but I had 340 people using it. What started happening, and there were fewer students in the intro stats class in the spring and more containers checked out. What started happening is regular people who were not students started using this because it was a painless way to get to our studio. They didn't have to install anything, and I'm fine with it. In fact, it's better for me, an infrastructure guy, if they do it this way because it uses less resource than if they got themselves a whole VM. So we're starting to see this kind of bleed over into the research side, and we're taking some of the containers we built for the instructional stuff and saying, okay, well, let's put them on more capable hardware with maybe a little different set of libraries and hooked up to different data sets and use that for research stuff. Uh, yeah, so where'd we end up with? Uh, a lot of RStudio and then in the kick the tire stuff, quite a few people playing with MATLAB and Eclipse. And about 250 VM managed VMs last spring. Most of them Ubuntu and a statistics thing and some bioinformatics. Of course, our work is never done. So what's the current thing? I showed you the stuff, the cool stuff from the past. Well, one thing I'm working on is doing more things with these zero install clients in the web browser. That's an obvious one, pretty much. I'm just waiting for people to come to me with X things that they want to have, like what you just saw. We're moving some of the containers into researcher area. 
The thing that I'm the most jazzed about right now that I'm actively working on is something called Jupiter. Does anyone, some, besides the one person who has heard of it, <laughs> anyone else know what Jupiter is? Oh, you, this is worth the price of admission alone. <laughs> okay. Um, and I found out about this one because one of the faculty using VM managed VMs to teach some statistics stuff and gene sequencing told me about what she was doing with the VM she was building and then using for a, a workshop this summer. Jupiter is by Python, but language agnostic. That is, if you do stuff like mix markdown language with in cells, with cells that have code that you can execute, with cells that show the output of what you executed. So if you wanted to have a live textbook that had some markdown language that explained how to do stuff, and then had some examples of the code to do those things that you wanted the students to be able to modify and run and see what happened, this is what you would want to use for it, maybe. Um, I'd said, this is worth the price of admission. This is, I think, one of the coolest things I've seen in terms of I want to be able to do teaching and learning environments that are cool that people can use. And hey, it's still Linux underneath. Uh, you can have a cell that's a bash interpreter and do the same kind of crazy stuff like ask what processes are running and all that. There is a way to run Jupyter where the back end is a series of Docker containers that get instanced when the user visits that thing. So this net dovetails nicely with all the stuff I just told you about cool container things because the TriJupyter site which is run at Rackspace, I think, basically has a Jupyter Hub that when you go there, uh, launches a Docker container that puts you in a little jail where you can run stuff, and when you're all done, it throws it away because it's just for demo purposes. That's all open source, and you could run that yourself on your own infrastructure if you were so inclined. And because it's so cool, I will now take a chance, since everything else has worked, <laughs> Oops. Yeah. <laughs> See, this is why I record these things. <laughs> Jupiter Project. Uh, so the IPython guys realized that the, most of the infrastructure they were building didn't have to be tied to just Python and went through a bunch of work to separate those two things out. So you can certainly have Python interpreters hooked up to this, but you can have lots of other interpreters hooked up. They've got docs and all that stuff and they can support a whole bunch of languages that I think are cool, including like Ruby and Lua R. Try in your browser. Uh, so there's that thing and there's a plot. You can go in and edit stuff if you are so inclined. I think you just double click it. Yeah. Shift enter. Uh, if I get to stuff that needs to be run, I can just click on the run it and it will run it. So it's pretty slick. Um, there's one course, or one workshop that was using this over the summer. We have grand ambitions to, the next step for all the stuff we've been doing is to start supporting a Jupyter uh, cluster and let the faculty build these kind of worksheets with examples and run them against a Docker backend. So uh, you might want to check that out. I think it's cool. Um, so lots of source code and references. Um, in this presentation available there. So if you only write one thing down but wanted all this, it's 
go to duke.box.com slash try one and download the whole thing. Questions? Yes? Uh, so what do you do to, um, what do you use to maintain your containers? <laughs> maintain in what sense? Well, operating system. What, Ubuntu publishes a new root image. How do you rebuild your, your Docker container stack on a periodic basis? Okay, so the question is really around patching and that kind of stuff, and when new things come out, what do you do? And that's probably another thing that's worth a t-shirt, but I can't throw it that far, so you'll have to help. <laughs> <laughs> and if he doesn't help, then he has to ask a good question. Um, yeah, the issue of patching and support and all that stuff, because there is a script that will build the container, um, when I feel like I want to do a new one, I basically just execute the Docker build script again and it marches through and does all that stuff and then there is a new one that's created. However, I don't do that all that often because in the case of our studio, R is under really active development and the libraries, they keep changing the versions of the libraries so every time I do that I spend a bunch of time not with the base OS and patches there, that's all automated, but with fixing the dependencies in the R application libraries. So one way of doing it is the way I'm doing it here which is to say well every couple weeks is good enough and that's what I do. The crazy thing that my partner in crime at Duke, Rob Carter, who does identity management stuff, he's like my counterpart, but he's much more focused on the identity management thing. Rob's responsible for the Kerberos infrastructure at Duke, which means Rob's responsible for you being able to log into anything at Duke. Rob decided that it would be a good thing if he would take what he's got for the Kerberos KDC and move that into a container. And that is where Duke's KDC is running today. Why? The identity management guys are paranoid. I mean, they have to be, right? <laughs> they're paranoid not just for bad guys getting at all the keys, they're paranoid about what could happen if there's a patch that came down for the base OS or one of the libraries that they depend on that gets applied to their infrastructure that breaks Kerberos. If that happens, we're all screwed. And it's going to be, they're going to have a very bad day getting back to something that works. So because they're paranoid, what Rob did is set up a Jenkins instance to do continuous integration that does continuous builds of the Kerberos KDC in the container and then runs tests against it to make sure that the patches that just came down haven't broken anything so that he gets at least some early heads up that there are patches coming that are going to break your stuff. So the really right answer to your question, if you're into hardcore, I got to really keep it patched up, and Kerberos is something we really got to keep patched up, is you probably set up a Jenkins continuous build and script your Docker builds to build over and over and over again all the time and alert you if there's ever a patch that looks like it broke things. That's the right answer. Do you then publish them to the, do to the Docker Hub or do you, no. have, you have a, a local Docker Hub or something? Or um, we, yeah, so Docker, for those who are not into it, Docker the company has to make money somehow and so, but they've open sourced a bunch of their stuff so they're push the idea that publish all your stuff to the Docker Hub and just trust it and run stuff. Well, I don't trust stuff <laughs> that I didn't build myself. So mostly the only thing I ever get from the Docker Hub are things like a Red Hat or an Ubuntu base image, and I build all my stuff locally. I have a couple images published in Docker's Hub that people can grab, and they're tied to the GitHub repositories. It's sort of a public service, but I don't use that or publish things there because I don't think it's that interesting. Instead, I build them locally. In fact, what I've been doing is building stuff on the server that it runs on because then I know for sure it's going to run even if our internal infrastructure falls over. 
There are some other people who are doing work at Duke, Chris Collins, uh, the main one, who are setting up little Docker hubs for their stuff. They're doing websites. So I guess there's multiple answers here. We're, we're publishing some stuff just for public good. Things like the Kerberos KDC that we don't de want to depend on the Docker Hub being up or accessible that day. Instead, that's all built locally and built continuously. My stuff is built local to the servers because I want my servers to be able to run even if my infrastructure is having a semi-bad day. The guys doing the websites are doing a local Docker Hub. It kind of depends on what your use case is. But I'm paranoid, so. But not as bad as Rob. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> With Jimmy as my witness, Rob is more paranoid than me. <laughs> yeah. And the, the cable rails machines are still looking the way they did, or are you changing those as well? The which machines? The the collab machines, the in residence hall, not oh. the collab machines. The collab machines, uh, we build a new image for them once a semester and then it, for people who got new reservations, but I don't, once you check one out, it's your problem, it's not mine. But they're still running as a VM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that, I love Docker for some things. I love it for stuff like classes where you've got a whole bunch of students who want identical environments and that, and you want to use minimal resources for it. For people doing investigative work, doing projects, that kind of thing, they don't belong in Docker container, they belong on a full-fledged VM that they run themselves, and that's, so there's plenty of people doing that stuff, 250 or so last semester, and I think I'm betting we'll hit 350 this coming semester. Yeah. Um, so I actually had a class with uh, one of the guys from CrowdOS, and he explained that as the difference between a robot and a unicorn. So you use Docker for robots and you use a VM for unicorn. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> metaphor. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, from when I run it, I like to shell out because it's the easiest way to move files around. I mean, the IDE is nice and everything, but if you've got to move a bunch of files around because I'm just more comfortable with it, I shell out and move them around that way. They don't have to have a shell, but it's convenient, and at the end of the day, our, is, our studio is not totally housebroken yet. so. <laughs> In, a, in the best of all possible senses, it still shows its Linux heart a little bit. So ways they would use that, you can do things like wget or curl from within our studio, but sometimes it's just easier to do it out in the shell. That's why. Yeah. How long do the Docker container instances run for? Like the entire semester? Until I decide that it's time to patch them and do a new instance, so the entire semester or until it feels like it's time to patch something because there's a egregious problem. So what about using Puppet or Ansible to, to patch them patch while they run? That, yeah, that one came up a bunch with uh, our sysadmins who are big fans of Puppet and like Ansible too. We ended up coming down on the side of just rebuild it. Just rebuild it because then you know that it's reproducible. Um, sometimes Puppet run multiple times over a thing. You end up with results that you weren't quite expecting because <laughs> running you know, multiple different rules against that thing put it in a sort of odd state. So sometimes we call Puppet our own little chaos monkey. And <laughs> because of that experience, there was the feeling that, well, for these containers, since it's, you know, you can automate the build, just do a rebuild. Plus, it forces you to keep the build script current. If you don't do that, and getting to the state that you want to be in was, is start from the build script, and then these Puppet things happened a bunch of them at some indeterminate time because it's hard to schedule them precisely. 
well, that makes it hard for me to get to a known state and in a known amount of time. So just philosophically, we ended up coming down on that, just build it over again. It's, the startup times are fast enough, and you can do the build with you know, offline. That, that's what we ended up with. The other reason for that is if I'm going to run some of my stuff out in the cloud, then it's maybe a little bit easier to do the build and then move the image around than to have Puppet reaching out into my cloud instances. I think Puppet's good for some stuff, but this is not one that we decided to use it for. Although we thought hard about it at first, and there was a vigorous discussion. That's, that's a good one, about whether it was a good idea or not. Yeah? So, and then you contain the users as far as like uh, what they can do within the container, um, you know, what they have access to, and that type of thing. And, but as far as other like computing resources, like can uh, they just spin something out and just burn up the machine type of thing? From the, or can you limit it somehow? Right, so your question is around prisons inside a container, and that kind of limits them, but how much does it really limit them? Can they write a tight loop that chews a lot of CPU and gets you in trouble? There is a way to put some limits on how much a given container can consume. So the doctor guys understand that and have gotten into giving some options for doing limits. I'll tell the truth, I haven't turned any of that on. I've just watched with some interest as they've done that. So far, I've gotten away with it because those intro students haven't screwed themselves up too much, except for the ones who made containers that killed themselves, and there were only a couple of those. But <laughs> being able to constrain the maximum amount, amount of resource you can use in these kind of shared environments is a very good thing. Um, because we were doing this stuff pretty much just in time, almost, uh, some of the things that were nice, like what we're describing here, didn't get turned on, and then having gotten away with it for one semester, it's like, well, I need to work on other things, I'll get away with it for another semester. <laughs> Is it just turning on, or do you have to rebuild that with those, that functionality in, in the, you know? Uh, I think there's just a constraint that you can put in place when you instance the thing. Okay. Well, we haven't sh I haven't shown you, like, a build thing. Do you guys want to see what a build script looks like? Is that interesting, or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wave my hands about it, but I'd say I'm going to show it, but if you don't remind me, I might forget. <coughs> uh, so I make myself little projects uh, because I forget how to build things. I make a shell script that builds the thing. So sudo docker build, set the tag to be docker no bnc matlab. Uh, the Docker file itself, let's get rid of some of the crap in the background. Okay, Docker file itself. Uh, this one's descended from an Ubuntu base image, maintained by yours truly. Uh, because it's going to run without me being there to say yes to prompts, say, set things up to run uh, non interactive and then do a little bit of crud to get the latest patches applied. That's down here. The, and this is like boilerplate stuff that ends up in pretty much all of my build scripts. The interesting parts start right about here, where I'm grabbing a bunch of things I'll need, like there's X and Firefox and other stuff. The base OS images that you get for Docker tend to have just about nothing in them because the idea is to keep it lightweight and just add in the minimum stuff you need. So uh, you may need to add in things like wget <laughs> and vim if you want them. Uh, I'm using supervisor D to launch multiple processes inside the container. Hardcore Docker mavens believe that you should only one, run one process per container, and I understand where they're coming from, but for the things I need to do, I don't have multiple processes, so we run supervisor D and run multiple processes. Uh, there's some stuff to create an Ubuntu user. Look at the great password. <laughs> one of the things you probably want to do in your supervisor D 
is run a script that runs before anything else happens when the container gets started that goes and looks at an environment variable you passed in when you started the thing up and set the password to be that thing. Then you can have different passwords for each container because you set it when you instanced it and you don't care if people look at your build script because the bad password is not the password. It's a placeholder. Uh, and that is what initialize.sh is basically there for. It's to go and set up reading some environment variables that were passed in at runtime, set up some things like what's the password for this guy supposed to be. Uh, it also might read things like what's my host name? Since I don't know where I'm running until I get instance, it might be useful for me to know that as a container. Uh, add in some open box stuff because open box looked like the easiest way to get some minimal X desktop manager in place. Uh, the no VNC crud. And if you want to run no VNC over an HTTPS connection, take a look at the documentation at the GitHub site for this because I explain precisely what you need to do to do that, which is what chewed up a lot of time for me figuring out. It wasn't totally apparent. Uh, then I add a file for the MATLAB desktop icon, and uh, that's about it. The RStudio ones are a lot hairier because there's a lot more application-specific CRUD in place, but the build scripts are fairly readable, I think, and the discipline of having one of these and getting explicit about which ports you're exposing and all that is a godsend later. You can come back and figure out what's going on. Yeah. You want to talk about the intermediate builds and the cacheability? Uh, yeah. The doctor, one of the things I said in the slides was, boy, it's really cool. You can do in incremental builds, and if it screws up on some step, then you don't have to start from scratch because it's cached those things. When you're doing running these build scripts, what it's doing is basically making multiple layers in a f union file system for each step. So if one step fails, well, that didn't get written, but all the other ones leading up to there did. So therefore, you don't have to start from the beginning. So there's a cache. Um, and it saves you a bunch of time when you're in development land. You just hope that cache never gets confused or screwed up. It basically does a, a hash of the line and then look, uses that to look up your your union file system. And so if you change a line, it starts at that level and continues. And it's kind of cool, but, but. But make sure that you change the line if you want something new to right. happen. You either have to change the line or change something in the environment or use the dash dash no cache environment or the parameter when you're building. If you want to change something up, the, some, you want to pull in something that changed upstream. Like, for example, a new Python NumPy comes out that step might not necessarily get run unless you use no cache or change a parameter or something. Because I'm paranoid and got bitten by this, what I do when I'm building new instances is I blow away everything and prove to myself that the whole thing can get built and it's only another five minutes, it's not a big deal. But that caching thing saves you a ton of time when you're in development mode. Yeah. And you're doing close loop cycle. Yep. And then you forget about it and it bites you and you waste half a day trying to figure out why this thing didn't change. <laughs> We've all been there. Other questions? Yeah. Going back before when you were talking about the, the you haven't got bothered to set up the quotas on it. Um, are you doing any active load management or is it pretty much just divvying up the Docker containers equally among your various hosts? So far, I'm not doing active load ma management between the hosts because for the course-based stuff, they tend to be doing the same thing, right? I mean, they've got an assignment or a series of assignments, and mostly, unless they get really confused, it's the same set of actions. So, so the simple-minded thing has worked well enough so far. However, where we are headed with this in the research computing area is to say, if I want reproducible <coughs> analytical tools. I would like to package those in containers. And I start doing that and running big research compute jobs, which can chew up a lot of resources, that the issue you're talking about is going to become much, much more important because 
researchers have no mercy on infrastructure. They, <laughs> they will crush it because they need to. Students, on the other hand, are kind of a good place to start out because they're more forgiving. Once you get into more heterogeneous environments, it gets much more interesting. The, an interesting place that we're seeing doctors starting to get a little bit of traction, again on the research side of the house, is with some of the gene sequencing guys that have really hairy workflows where they've got to go through a series of different tools and they have a hard time getting someone else to be able to build an install that actually works because it's kind of tricky. You've got to have the right version of this and that right library and all that stuff. So there's some people in the genetics area at Duke that are putting together workflows for doing gene sequencing where it's a set of containers so that they can, A, get a researcher someplace else to run exactly the same code they're running by just saying, here's the container or the build file for it. Build this and you'll have what we have. And B, swap out one of the steps by changing the container and putting a different one in place. Um, there's a story I couldn't tell. Why not? So there was a researcher that showed up that needed a whole bunch of cores and a lot of memory, a really big memory machine. And my boss said, hey, we've got one that's not being used for like the next three weeks and got some of the OS guys to put an operating system on there, on bare metal. Uh, and they installed Red Hat, and well and good, but what she wanted to do was run a bunch of R stuff. And because it needed to run on something with lots of cores, you want the linear algebra stuff to multi-thread so it'll take advantage of all those cores. Otherwise, you've got all those cores sitting doing nothing. And I discovered, since I got stuck with here, what, Mark, you've done a bunch of R crap. <laughs> You build the R. It's like, um, it turns out that under Ubuntu, it's pretty easy to get the open linear algebra, open blast libraries installed because you can just run this package and it'll put them in place. But it's harder under Red Hat. You have to compile from source. And it was a Friday afternoon, and <laughs> I wanted to go home. So what I ended up doing is taking uh, a container with the Ubuntu stuff on it, mostly because it already worked and I wanted to go home and put it over there and ran that and took advantage of multiple cores. So that kind of thing where it's making the whole environment, including OS and libraries, portable is sort of a win. Uh, now, I'm over here at Red Hat land, so you know, this happens on both sides, but if you think about researchers and the problems of getting their weird stuff moved to other people, I lived a small version of that with, hey, quick, get an instance of R up that can take advantage of multiple cores. The easy way was the container. So I think we'll see more and more of that going forward, at least for lazy people. Anybody else? So I have a question, a loaded question. So one thing I think is interesting, and I answer your answer this. So for, for VMs, you have like Visa, right? A, a very nice management. It's kind of like your question about how much load are they using with memory. Yeah. There really isn't anything like that for Docker. Actually, well, Red Hat. Kubernetes, but that's. Kubernetes sort of is kind of there. Red Hat is working on something that sounds quite intriguing along those lines. You have to assume that, uh, excuse me, Docker is working on something along those lines. And I would presume that Red Hat and everybody else is working on it. Given the amount of traction the containers are getting, and given that this issue of managing heterogeneous workloads is the obvious one that comes up, and that I've carefully danced around having that problem by doing stuff for classes, and it's all homogeneous. There's going to be, I think, quite a few of these tools for doing the equivalent of what vCenter does. There have to be. That's the logical next step, and that's probably what you can charge for. If you're thinking about where do these open source mon companies make some money, that kind of value-add stuff is one place. Apache Mesos is a, an Apache project that is supposed to do resource management and workload management around Docker containers. Yeah. So I guess my 
closing comment, to sum up my presentation, we can keep talking questions, but if I was looking for the big summary, it's if where I, what I think Linux is moving towards is towards these sort of containerized environments where I can build the whole thing custom to what I need, and then I can move it around to different infrastructure. So I really don't care if it ran on Amazon, Google Compute, locally, Azure, doesn't matter. I've packaged all my stuff up and it's mobile. And that's the value add for these kind of containers things. That's what Mesos is supposed to do. I yep. tried it. More questions? Have you had enough? Yeah. Well, it's almost the closing time. But, yeah. Good. All right, thank you. <coughs> All right, everyone, thank you for coming. Um, All right, so...